Tonight we're going to be, we're going to be going head first here into, into Psalm chapter 11. And it will be a fair statement to say that Psalm chapter 11 is a theme chapter. This chapter uh, may be one of the shorter chapters in all of Scripture. Uh, it only has about seven verses in it, so it's not going to take us that long to get through it. It may be one of the shorter chapters in Scripture, but there's more meat here inside of Psalm chapter 11 than there is in a grocery store the week before Thanksgiving. I mean, this thing is, this thing is loaded right here. Now, I spoke to you this, uh, this past Sunday about, about following a man so long as he's following the Lord. So we're going to touch back on that today. But let's, uh, let's go to the Scripture and see what Scripture says here. Psalm chapter 11. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow and make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible, and a horrible temptest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, his countenance doth behold the upright. Father God, Lord, we thank you today for the reading and the hearing of your word. Lord, we just ask you, Lord, there if there be one uh, under the sound of a voice that's unsure about their, about their salvation, Lord, they can get it settled today, Lord. Lord, if they're unsure in what they're following, they can get that settled today as well, Lord. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. Lord, we thank you most of all for sending your Son to die on the cross for our sins. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, as we look here at... Uh, at verse one, I'm going to read this for us here, but I, we need to uh, we need to understand that this is this is probably one of the most uh, powerful sets of instructions that we can get. And by by instructions, what I'm specifically talking about is we have an opportunity to follow someone by example. Here, we talked about it Sunday with Paul telling us uh, uh, in First Corinthians 11 and one. So we're in a uh, we're in Psalm 11, so I don't want it to get confusing on you, but in 1 Corinthians 11 and 1, Paul says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So as we look here in, in Psalm 11, we're going to consider the first word, the first seven words in particular of Psalm 11 1. We're going to look at them as, as the action, the number one action that believers... Ought to uh, ought to follow another man in this. This is if we see anybody doing anything, what we're talking about here in Psalm 11, what David does. This is an example of what we ought to follow. I've always um, I've always heard, and some of you may I forget who I was talking with about this recently, but. Uh, um, I've always heard that if someone feels invested in what they're what they're getting involved in, then they're more likely to stay involved in it. Uh, I was talking to somebody about the Bible college that I want to put together. I want to do it as cheap as possible, but if people don't pay a little something for it, then they'll they'll start it and they'll never finish it. So they need to pay a little something to to feel invested. And that that's how people in general are. If they if they've got time in it, if they got money in it. They most of the time they want to they want to see things through. Now salvation is a is a very unique thing for us because salvation it, it really gets under the skin of people that want to do something themselves because you you get into a situation here where you can't do it yourself. You've got to have somebody do it for you, and it's just it's a free gift. You can't do anything to earn it. But we're going to talk about today what you can do, what your responsibility is in the salvation process, which isn't very much at all. But Psalm chapter 11, it starts off with the, with the, uh, the definition of what it looks like to place your faith in the Lord. Psalm 11 and 1 says, In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? Now... <laughs> There's a particular group of people that it hurts me to even think about them on a regular basis. Folks that think they've done anything to earn their salvation. 
That group of people, it, I'm bothered for them. I, that group of people's lost. There's, there's no way around it. If you think you've done anything for your salvation, you're lost. Outside of trusting God, outside of trusting Him that His death, burial, and resurrection was enough, anything you believe that, is, that you had to contribute is what's keeping you from being saved. It, it can be as simple as raising your hand and coming down the aisle and praying a prayer. If you think you had to do that in order to get saved, you're lost. If you think you had to even um, go to God and say, God, I repent of my sins, then you're lost. Repent repentance is not inside of the gospel. Repentance is something you do after you're saved, not before you're saved. So there is nothing. You, you can't apologize enough for being bad to be saved if you hadn't been made good and righteous before it takes place. You can apologize all you want after the fact, and you may be sorry before the fact, but if you haven't trusted Jesus first, you're as, you're as lost as Adam's house cat when he come back and they were gone out the garden. I mean, you, you're just lost in that situation. But I feel for this group of people that think that their works have something to do with it because there's a lot of good people in those groups. There's a, there's a lot of people that do a lot of good. There's a lot of people that think they're doing a lot of good in the name of Christ, but really they're not doing anything that's of any value to Christ because they're lost. And, and a matter of fact, they, they may actually be hurting the cause of Christ because they're doing it from a position of being lost. Isaiah 64 and 6, the Word of God says this, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. So these folks that are in that group that believe that they've done enough to earn their salvation, any works-based religion, it doesn't matter which one it is, what they're doing is they're, sub, they're, they're saying, hey, look at the works that I've done, these qualify me for, for salvation. I, I'm good enough to earn it. But what Scripture says is our righteousness, this includes our good works, are as filthy rags. Now, I want you to understand this. Kids, are you paying attention? Because this y'all might think this is a little bit funny here. Okay? Filthy rags. In Scripture, this is, this is gross. This isn't talking about something you wipe the table with. Filthy rags... It's literally talking about something somebody's cleaned their rear end with. Do you know what I mean? They've, they've wiped their butt with it, Cash. Can you believe that? That that's what the Bible's talking about? Because that's what it's talking about. That's exactly what's being talked about here. It's just a tactful way of saying it. That's what our righteousness is compared to. It's not just a dirty rag that you clean the floor with, that you wipe the baseboards with. Your good works are compared to a dirty rag that you've washed your backside with. Now, how gross is that? That that's what they compare your, your best day to is that poop rag. That's your best sitting right here. Who in this room, besides John, who in this room would want to show off their poop rag to somebody else? Anybody? Any? No, nobody? No, not one, not one, one person? Just John? I mean, you know what cats do with theirs, John? They bury it. They're embarrassed. My, I mean, dogs don't even use those rags. They'll drag their butt across the carpet. But ladies, there ain't one of you in here that's going to go to the bathroom and call somebody in there to look at it, is there? Now, I, 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 I said you would, John. Don't worry. I, we, know, we know how you are. But they, fellas sure are different than women. I'm, I'm going to tell you. They, hey, come look at this thing. Yeah, right? <laughs> we can measure it. Would you, you can measure them with your phone now, Pastor. Yeah, I don't know if you knew that or not. They got, they, they got that app. But, ladies, so y'all wouldn't do that? Y'all wouldn't call somebody in there to come look after you've gone to the bathroom to... You, it's not impressive, right? Well, that's exactly what people do when they're saying, hey, look at my works. They're literally saying, hey, look at this crap I've got over here. And it's not good no matter what. That, and 
I know I say it and it, it sounds funny to think about somebody coming to, to look at somebody's mess that they've made like that, but that's literally what these folks are doing. They, they, and they, they think they're going to they're gonna show their filthy rags to God and, and God's going to say, yeah, come on in, man. You, 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 you made it. You, you, you did it just right. That's just what I wanted to see is your filthy rags. Congratulations. No, that's, that's not it. As much as if I said, hey, come look at my filthy rags and, and was showing you the real McCoy, as much as that would gross you out, Patsy, and I know it would, that's exactly what, it, that's exactly what the scenario would feel like for, for God if you're trying to show him your good works. He's going to look at it the same way you would look at, at, a, at a, a poop napkin. Hmm? Lord, yes, right here. It says, but, but we are all as unclean things and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. It's, it's right here. That's what filthy rags means. Is, that, that's it. It's meant to be gross. For the folks that would have read this back, back in the time period where it was written, they would have known exactly what that meant. It was meant to be stomach turning. So when I come here and tell you exactly what it is, I mean to do it to turn your stomach the way folks reading this, their stomach would have been turned. It's meant to be disgusting. Nobody would want to show it off, but that's exactly what people are doing. Our only option for salvation is either not having it, we have, we have two, either not having it or putting our faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ because nothing we've got is going to be good enough. Uh, in verse 1, it's going to be of the utmost importance for us as Christians to examine our faith. We need to be sure that our faith is in the right place. We need to be sure that our faith is in the right person. I, I think we can wrap our minds around what it means to trust God, but what becomes difficult is the second part of verse 1. But let's look at the whole thing here. and We're going to compare the beginning to the end. In the Lord put I my trust. All right, that's the first part. So th this is what a Christian needs to know. A Bible believer needs to put their trust in the Lord. Now, now that your trust is in the Lord, if you get your mind wrapped around that, let's read the rest of the verse. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? Now, something may seem off to you if you're putting your trust in the Lord, but in the very same verse, you're being instructed to flee into the mountain. Like, well, I'm trusting God, right? Why should I have to flee from anything if I'm trusting God? And this is in, it's in the very same verse here. I want you to understand, first off, who's giving the instruction. It's David talking, but it's David talking about instruction that he's getting from the Lord. And let's look at, um, let's look at how it's worded here, because wording is key to rightly dividing Scripture. It says, How say ye, this is to, uh, to my soul, this is, I'm going to paraphrase here, he said, God, why are you saying this to me after I've trusted you? Flee as a bird to your mountain." Watch, it's who said it. God told him to flee. His trust is in God. But where did He tell him to go? Not a mountain. He told him to go to your mountain. My mountain. If, if, imagine for a moment that our God telling you this. Go, uh, um, go to my mountain is basically what God would have been saying. And as David quotes it back, he says, flee as a bird to your mountain. Not just anywhere. The idea here that, that we need to, to understand when we read this is we're not being told to retreat. We're being told to run to something, and there's a big difference in the two. Our trust is in God, and we're being told to run to His mountain, and His mountain is our place of refuge. We, we need to keep in mind here that the, the Lord has King David... Uh, who trust in Him to flee. If we can trust God to save us, then we can trust God to give us refuge in the process. We can trust Him to give us refuge from the, this evil world. Now, in that time period, when you're trusting God, you are going to, without doubt, have moments where it gets hard. You're going to have a difficult time. You're going to go through grief. You're going to go through loss. You're going to go through depression. You're going to, you're going to go through all sorts of things that you think, hey, 
I ought not have to go through this because I'm trusting in God. Well, God, I'm trusting, I'm trusting you, and your Bible says your grace is sufficient, but right now I'm hurting so bad. You're going to have those moments where it hurts, and you need to train yourself like King David was trained to understand that when times are hard and when times are rough, you're not retreating and giving up because you're a blood-bought, born-again Christian. You're not of your own. You belong to someone else. You're not out there serving your own will. You're out there serving God's. And if you're going to serve God's will, you need to be about God's business and do what God would have you do. Don't retreat, but run to God and cling to His Word because hard times are going to pop out and they're going to, they're, they're going to stick their ugly heads out. We need to remember in those times to trust, the, to trust in God. So, so why do we flee to the mountain period here. Verse 2 tells us why. For lo, the wicked bend their bow, they make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. King David warned us about this in Psalm chapter 10 when we were talking about the, that, the wicked being the mirror image of the Antichrist. We are not capable of standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan, no matter what someone of the likes of Kenneth Copeland wants to say to you. Kenneth Copeland wants to call the, the devil a, a big pussycat, is what he calls him. Uh, Kenneth Copeland is full of crap. That's what he is. He's full of what's on those filthy rags. That's exactly what he is. He's, he's a wicked man that's pointing people to a... I, I can't even call it a prosperity gospel. There's nothing good about what, what the man is saying. People are not capable of standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan. Furthermore, it will be stupid for us to even try to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Him when we've been given instructions by God, the one that's supposed to protect us, to flee, to take refuge to where, where He's given us specific instructions to take refuge at. Now, I want to clear up what we're not talking about for a moment. When I'm talking about fighting these spiritual warfare here, I'm not talking about you physically being on a battlefield with a, with a sword and a shield and, and armor fighting off demons and devils. I'm not talking about anything physical. What I'm talking about is spiritual warfare. When you're fighting a spiritual battle, then you need to fight with spiritual weapons. You, you don't need to even get it in the thought process. You don't even need it to cross your mind that that this is going to require you to be on a physical battlefield. It's not the case. It, it will be great. To, it's great for Satan to trick you into to thinking of it in in physical terms. But this is a spiritual matter. You need to put you need to put your spiritual armor on here and and understand that that you're fighting against things that you can't see, but things that are there nonetheless. Hebrews four and twelve. The Word of God says this. This is talking about your spiritual weapons here. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, the Word of God is a sword. It's a weapon for spiritual warfare. If you went and took this book and tried to fight somebody that had a physical sword with this book, you'd be up the creek pretty quick. They're they going to cut you. They're they, they going to get you pretty, pretty easily. But when you go into a spiritual battle, you need this spiritual weapon. Now, we can also take refuge behind God's Word. It's not just a sword, but it can be used as a shield. In fact, if you've ever done any type of sword fight, and especially as a kid, you'll understand quickly that you've got to learn how to block with that sword just as good as you do anything. Because most of the time when you're a kid, you don't even have a shield. I mean, if you, you were lucky to have a garbage can lid or something, but, I mean, come on, if you didn't have that, you had to use that sword and had to know how to use it as a shield. You had to learn how to, how to parry and how to, how to move and how to make, make uh, other things deflect off of your sword there. But along with this, this Word of God being a sword, it's also a shield for us. We can take a refuge behind it the same way Christ did when He was on the mountain. In Matthew chapter 4, we see how Jesus used the Word as a shield and a sword. Jesus kept using the Word over and over and over. He kept saying, He, he said it three times to the devil, It is written. When the devil would try to tempt him, he would go straight to Scripture and he would say, It is written, blah, 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 blah. And he would tell him something here because the, he's, the devil's actively trying to tempt even God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. He's actively trying to tempt him. 
the only shield that he had and the only shield he required was the Word of God. Now I want you to consider this. This happens to Jesus on a mountaintop. What David's being uh, spoken up to here in Psalm chapter 11 is talking about fleeing to the mountain, taking refuge. Literally, now, now David, is, he is a type of Jesus Christ. He is, a, he is someone that would foreshadow Jesus Christ is coming. Where David's told to go to the mountain, Jesus is physically on the mountain and he's taking refuge behind God's Word the way David's told to take refuge behind God. These are very similar moments here. There's so much effort put in by Satan and by human co-conspirators to provide false replicas of the Word of God in an attempt to disarm Christians. I told you, this is a spiritual sword and they want to take it out of your hands. Satan is laughing at folks that are heading down range with worthless weaponry. Frank, it ain't fun going down range without bullets, is it? Mm. Nope. Satan's laughing at people who are walking around with toy swords. Walking around with swords they don't know how to use, they haven't rightly divided, they don't know their weapons. He's laughing at them. There's a generation of professing believers right now who do not really put their trust in the Lord. They say, oh, I'm a Christian. But they have absolutely no trust in the Lord whatsoever. You go to any seminary in this country for the most part, any of, any of the most popular ones anyway, you go to them and you're going to find that they're full of men that preach a book that they do not believe in. They're, they preach a book that they believe doesn't even exist. The men in the seminaries do not think that God was capable of doing His job and doing what He said of preserving His Word. They think, it's, they think that there's a, somewhere in the world, there's a Bible somewhere that's perfect, but they can't point you to it, but they, but they can tell you about it, and they know what's in it, but they've never seen it. There's a lot of garbage coming out of the seminaries. There's a lot of fake Swords coming out of the seminaries. I mean, I, I remember growing up and, and sword fighting with the what, what, what's the little dial on the the blinds? You know, the the rod, the the. the I remember sword fighting with them things growing up now, and slapping people on the hand with them. You talk. I remember getting a spanking with them too. Now that's about the worst thing in the world to get a spanking with. Hey, that they they hurt. But I'm gonna tell you what. If you got to stand in front of somebody that's got a real sword, that's got a katana or something, they're swinging that katana and all you got is that little blind rod, man, you better hang it up. You better, you better hope to God they miss because that katana is going to, it's going to kill you. That little, uh, that little blind rod, it might blister somebody's butt one time, but you're asking to die there. And that's exactly what we have happening with folks that, that have these perverted versions of, of Scripture, they're coming in with toy swords, they're coming in with things that don't get, thing, that, that don't get doctrine right, they're coming in with things that purposely get it wrong. I mean, there's so much, they're, they're coming in with things that, that rob God, that rob Jesus Christ, that rob the blood, that rob all sorts of things. They're fake, they're toy swords. We've got a whole generation being raised on toy swords. Now, you know, that's something about it, though. That, that toy sword just doesn't have any authority whatsoever. Hey, I mean, th you think about it, think. If, if, if you were put on your knees and somebody was going to cut your head off, God forbid that never happens, and they come out with a toy sword, I mean, don't you, don't you think that'd be kind of funny? A little, little like, oh, this is a big joke. But now they come out, they come out with one that, you know, you can hear the metal coming out the sheath. <laughs> oh, man, this this we about to have a bad day. Somebody about to lose their head here. There's no authority in that toy sword. There's no need to. There's no need to fear anything. None of them profess to be perfect. They all profess to be to be fallible. And somewhere between the bunch of them, you might get lucky and find your your real sword. Well, that, that's a bunch of garbage there. If you're going to go do spiritual warfare, do you really think that God Almighty would put you on a spiritual battlefield with, no, with, with useless armor or a useless weapon? If you think that, you haven't trusted in the, in the same God that I'm telling you about here. And instead of the New Age versions being able to say it is written, 
they would have said something like, well, it should be written this way, but it's not. It's, it should be written this way. They would say, well, the best... You know, now imagine if Jesus was some kind of New Age liberal God or something. Uh, well, the best Greek and Hebrew scholars around, they say, or <laughs> one interpretation of Scripture, Satan, is you should leave. Um, or I have heard, I haven't read for myself, but I have heard that the Word of God says X, Y, and Z. They've got absolutely no authority in that. There's nothing there. I mean, do you think Satan really would have, would have uh, fled from Jesus had Jesus been uh, giving him a pretend scripture? No. Satan, the bad thing about it is we've got, we've got Satan, who's the God of the world, who knows scripture better than professing Christians. That's a shame. The presence of evil can lead to a shaken faith. The lack of biblical knowledge is going to lead to it quicker, though. As we look here in verse, uh, verse 3, we're going to see King David ask us a rhetorical question. He says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? First off, I want to say this. If you're in here today and you're a born-again child of God, your foundations can't be destroyed. Now, you can have all the appearance of the foundations being destroyed. As Christians, we put all of our eggs in one basket. We literally count our chickens before they hatch. We trust in God 100% when we, when we believe in Him by faith. We don't have to worry about cracks in the foundation. We don't have to worry about absolutely anything. But what's happening with Christianity is Christianity is becoming more and more hated as time goes on. If you're a white man then with Christian values, then you're considered a racist now. Uh, I mean, that's, just, that's just funny to me. If you're a black man and you have Christian values now, now you're Uncle Tom or a race traitor. Like, they want absolutely nothing to do with Christianity in the world today. They, they want to get rid of it. They want it to, they want it to be outlawed. And I'm going to tell you, when they outlaw Christianity, only outlaws will be Christians. So y'all better uh, put your chaps on, get your boots ready, because they want Christianity gone. We don't have to worry about it being gone, because by the, time we're, by the time the church is called out of here, it's too late. We don't have to worry about it anymore. But that is what they want. And with that being said, a Christian has two options in this world right now. And I hope to God that none of y'all take option one because option one is just pathetic here. Option one is to keep your mouth shut about Scripture. Don't say anything to anybody. Don't stir the pot. Don't do anything. Let everybody form their own opinions. There's nowhere in Scripture you can find where that's what a Christian's called to do. The other thing that you should do, which is your other option, this, which is where you're actively involved in being in the hands and feet of Christ here, is you can heed the warning that the Apostle Paul gave us in 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 and 4. He says, because when it looks like the foundations crack, when morality is over, when, when po politically we're, we've gone to hell in a handbasket, when, when it looks like that there's no Christian value left among anything, when you can't turn the TV on without seeing something that's anti-God, I, I think we're there. But let's look at what... Uh, what, what that means, though, we're going to look at what the Apostle Paul says, is we're out of season. We're out of season right now as Christians. Second Timothy 4, verses 2 through 4 says, Preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Morality is practically gone. Justice is practically gone. Righteousness, I'm not even 100% that, it, that there's even a fragment of it left anymore. But as Christians, we ought to have an unwavering trust in the Lord and that His Word will sustain us and be our refuge. We don't need to run away from anything. We need to run to the Lord. I know some of y'all have seen the movie The Patriot. Who's seen The Patriot in here? The Mel Gibson flick. Now, ironically, Michelle's dad played in The Patriot. So that's... Um, that's no joke. He, he was literally in the movie. I've, got, I've seen video evidence of this. 
Um, so I know y'all have seen it. I know y'all seen it, but there's one scene in there. It's, it's everybody's favorite scene, I think. Um, well, no, my favorite scene is when he opens the door of the, of the little um, bar and he says, uh, God has saved King George, and they all throw the axes at him and stuff, and that, that one's my favorite scene. But my second favorite scene, which is most people's favorite scene, is the last battle. Now, I do believe your dad was in that battle, Michelle, in, on, on the big train. I think that's where I saw him at. In the last battle, uh, Mel Gibson's character, Benjamin Martin, He's, that's to who he's portraying. That's a, that's a fictional character, by the way. But it's, a multi, it's a group of people and a melting pot made one character. But he plays, he plays a colonel in the, uh, in the militia. And the militia at the time, they were known for retreating way too early. They weren't, they weren't as uh, hard-nosed as the, as the Continental Army regulars. The militia, they, they just couldn't stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the redcoats. They'd run off. And it's natural to run off when you're getting shot at, though. That's, that's just that's a natural thing, especially when you don't have the training and, and to stand there when you're literally last week you were, you were working in the fields and this week you're, you're standing there shooting at redcoats. I mean, it's, there's, something, there's something to be said about just the bravery to be out there at all. But these guys, they would stand there and they would, they would uh, trade fire front, like, right in front of each other with, the, with these redcoats now, the Redcoats knew that this militia will, will leave. They'll run. But the militia knew that the Redcoats knew that the militia would run. So the militia used the idea that, hey, we're going to run in retreat, but we're not really retreating. We're running for refuge, not for retreat. So you see it in the movie. They, they go up. They, they fire their shots. They, they got off two shots, and then they ran back. They retreated, they, uh, they laid on the ground, and then the, the, uh, the Continental Army, regular Army soldiers stood up. The, uh, <clears throat> the Redcoats had chased them over the top of a hill. They didn't see it coming. Boom. They, the Redcoats are in this. They, they're the devil. We're going to call them the devil. I'm, I'm not taking that one back either. A bunch of, you know, red Redcoats. Yeah, yeah. So the red coats give chase the same way the devil would come after you uh, when, when you're retreating. They give chase, but they don't realize, hey, they're going over to refuge. They just run into a trap. They, they run to where they knew the protection was. And as Christians, we need to have the same mentality that we're in spiritual warfare. We don't need to retreat because you do not win by retreating, but you can win by getting to refuge. You can win by getting back to, uh, into your own camp here. You can get, win to, to get where you have protection. Not only did they have protection, but when they crossed that hill, now the redcoats were outgunned. It's warfare. Spiritual warfare is just like it. Verses 4 through 6, they, they're going to help us take a deeper look at some characteristics and attributes of God, and we're going to go quickly here. One, we're going to look at how God deals with His children. Verse 4, The Lord in His holy temple, the Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, His eyelids try the children of men. Now, what we've got here in this verse is, a, this is a big old long word for you here. This is an anthropomorphism. That's a word, right? That's a $6 word, I think, what they call those. That's about as hard to spell as baloney. This means that the, the writer is giving human-like characteristics to God for the reason of helping us understand Him better. That's, that's what anthropomorphism means. That's a, that's a mouthful, isn't it? It's such a mouthful that in my notes here I had to break it up into three different words so I could actually say it. The takeaway from this verse isn't that, that God has physical eyes or physical eyelids, because God's spirit, but the writer gives him eyes and eyelids here. The takeaway is he's watching us. He sees us in our affliction. He sees us in our trials. We're going to go through trials as a believer, and it will behoove us to understand that not every trial that you go through is a punishment. John, every time that trailer breaks down, it's not a punishment from God. Uh, that, that just, it is what it is. Sometimes it could be protecting you. Sometimes it could be showing you that, hey, 60 people I know are going to come out there beside the road and come talk to me and try to help me get going. I bet that, that had to feel good right there. Uh, John, John jokes with me. I say, hey, John, what you need while you're beside the road? He says, a cold beer. 
I knew he was joking. I stopped at the store and got him a root beer and brought it to him. It was, it was, uh, it was pretty funny. He got, a, he got a kick out of it. He sucked them root beers down, let me tell you. It was hot out there. But sometimes you need to know, hey, I, I, you've got friends that have you back now. Because, John, when we first met, you, you, had, you had told me something. You know, I'm always doing something for people. And, and, they, and they, you know, it's, a, it's, I, it's one-sided all the time. Nobody ever does anything. For me. And now you've got people they'll do for you. Isn't that funny? How God, you might have to break down a time or two to realize it, but you might have to break down up in, uh, in Virginia or Ohio and, and call somebody to come get you that just leave the house in their drawers in the middle of the night and drive all the way up there to come get you, fall asleep twice, and, and you know, you, you might have to do that to find out that you got people that care about you. Every trial is not a, is not a punishment. Pickle family, where are you at back there? The trials that y'all have been through before getting here were absolutely horrible. And through those trials, look, doors get opened up. You get the confirmation you need that you're going to where God would have you. You get down here. You think you're not going to have a job. You got a job within the week. You even got invited deep sea fishing. You didn't go because you didn't like us good enough yet. But you got to already experience uh, what going through a trial led to there. It wasn't for punishment. You went through a trial because you were being faithful. Hey, good, good for you. Many trials are to strengthen us. Consider Job. After his trials, he came out strengthened with a renewed faith. Consider the Apostle Paul. When Paul was blinded on the road to Damascus, now being blinded, that's pretty rough right there. That, that's about the worst thing I could think could happen to a person. When he was blinded on the road to Damascus, it helped him spiritually. It, was, it wasn't a punishment. This was to help him out. And him being blinded, it consequently helped all of us out. Now let's look at how God deals with the wicked and we'll wrap up. Verse 5 says, we're still talking about the righteous here. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. This is talking about God's soul. Hates the wicked. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. There is a fairy tale that is believed by the majority of profession Christians that God loves everyone. God does not love everyone. God loved everyone. God gave His love in the past tense on the cross when He gave Jesus Christ if you'll think about John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He loved and He gave. Past tense. God does not love the world. He does not love the sinful world anymore. He's done everything for them that could be done. If they go to hell now, it's because they've rejected His Son. The fairy tale, though, is that, oh, God, God is love. God, God. You know what that leads to? That leads to people having this question right here. Well, if God is so much love, why do children get cancer? How are you going to answer that, God is love? Oh, that's some love, right? Mm. Think about that. Oh, if, if God is love, then why did my loved one die? Mm. How many people do you think have been turned away from the Lord because somebody's lied to them about His attributes? God can and does hate. Righteously so. God doesn't even accept partial offers. These, this God is love crowd, you know, what you'll eventually wind up with is the theologies that we have being taught today. Oh, yeah, brother, you can you can be a homosexual and and you can you can do this and that. God loves you, brother. God just loves you the way you are. Hmm. You're full of crap. You're filthy rags. Those filthy rags, man. Hmm. That is some garbage right there. God does not accept partial offerings. God doesn't even accept offerings of things that He doesn't want. So if you're given a partial offering that's including something He doesn't want, 
Do you really think he's going to accept that? The only way to salvation is putting your faith, hope, and trust in Jesus Christ and Him crucified, giving yourself to Him completely. Does that mean you're going to be sinless and, and, and perfect going forward? Absolutely not. It doesn't. Does that mean that you'll be convicted of your sin when you do that? Absolutely it does. You'll be convicted of that sin. And you, you may not be convicted right away. There was things in my life when I got saved I wasn't convicted of right away until I got back in the book and I read, well, I guess I've got to be convicted over that. I've got to stop doing that now. I've got to stop doing this. I didn't think there was anything wrong here, but you know, it's, it's up to me. I've got, to, I've got to turn this program off. I'm going to turn this one on and I'm getting my Bible more, stop listening to music as much. And you know, there's, there's things that just have to change. And when you know about it, when you know it's wrong and refuse to change it, then you're going to deal with the wrath of God in a different way. Well, excuse me, not the wrath. You're going to deal with God's chastisement when that happens. The, the saved person deals with chastisement the way, the way that, a, that a child gets chastised by a parent. If, a, if I see my child doing something, guess what? I'm going to tear that child's tail up if they're wrong. But if I see someone else's child doing something, I'm not. That's not my child. I'm, I, might, I might say, well, I'm glad that one's not mine. I might do something of that nature. I might tell the parent to see if the parent does anything because it's their child, and I would hope they would tell me if my child was doing something wrong. But when we're dealing with a holy God, He will let that person that's lost do as much wrong and wicked as they want to do because they're not His. He doesn't care about them. He doesn't love them the way He loves His children. And you've got to understand that. You've got to get this God is love and just pure love out of your head. It's not biblical whatsoever. God is love, but God is way more than love. God is just. And just gets in the way of love from time to time. You know, if, if God were just pure love, there would be, no, there would be nothing bad that happens. He, he would be able to will everything good to happen. And, and I want you to understand this. He's God. People say, oh, God can't do this, God can't do that because He would stop being God. Listen, God can do what He wants, when He wants, where He wants, to who He wants. Nothing stops Him other than He said He would and would not do things, and He's a God that keeps His Word. If He wanted to be a God that breaks His Word, He's still Almighty God. If He wanted to snap His fingers and make it so that, that hell never existed, He could do that. That's within the realm of He created it, He can uncreate it. He's not going to. If I create something and I tell you this is the penalty for not doing this, and I've got all the power of God Almighty, and then at the end of the, at the, end of the day you didn't choose to do right to, to go to heaven, you wound up going to hell. If I let you go to hell, is that an act of love? or That's an act of justice. That's what he, He's a just God. You better thank God He's not a fair God because if He was fair, we'd all go to hell. God dealt with the sin of believers on the cross. And if a person wants to continue sinning intentionally after salvation, God will deal with that sin through chastisement. I've told you this before. I'm going to tell you again. He deals with the lost on credit. He deals with the saved in cash. You sin, you will pay. The wicked also known as the lost, they get something else. Instead of getting God's chastisement, instead of getting that fairy tale, they get God's wrath. It's on them. Verse 5 tells us that God hates the wicked. Let me read it again to you. The Lord tried the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Don't believe the lie that God loves the lost. He loved the lost. Past tense. If the lost reject the sacrifice of his son, God will let them go to hell. If that boy right there died for you and you didn't accept it, I'd let you go to hell. Doctrinally, for Old Testament saints and New Testament saints, there's a verse um, Verse 7 is talking about obtaining favor from God. We're going to look at it here. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. 
For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, his conscience doth behold the upright. Now, this goes both ways for Old Testament and New Testament saints here. King David wrote this psalm uh, to a group of people that obedience was required from. The New Testament Christian, this is for them as well, but it's a little bit different because in, instead of um, submitting and being obedient, we're required to submit by faith and faith alone. Without being washed in the blood, there's no way to be made righteous. So our foundation and our refuge is in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The people this was written to originally, their foundation and refuge was in believing and also being obedient. We have, we have a more sure refuge than what David had. When we follow the instructions that King David gives, and we put our trust in the Lord, and we follow His example, we do so exclusively by believing the gospel. You can either take refuge in the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture and was buried and rose again on the third day according to the Scripture, or you're not in a place of refuge. You're in a state of rebellion if you haven't believed that. If you need something to rebel from, and I'm going to tell you what, we all need something to rebel from from time to time. Rebel from the world, not the Word. The world wants you to rebel from the Word. But if you'll cling to the Word, you'll naturally rebel from the world. You'll realize you don't fit in if you believe what this book says. Father God, Lord, we come to You, Lord, today in the name of Jesus, Lord, in the name of all names. God, we thank You today for the reading and the hearing of Your Word, Lord. Lord, this is a short psalm, Lord, but it's, it's got a lot of meat in there for us, Lord. There's a lot for us to, to hold on to. There's a lot for us to consider. Lord, we, we just thank You for all that You do. Uh, Lord, we pray that maybe somebody could, could have just a little better understanding of, of how they should believe and how they should trust in You, God. Lord, we thank You for all that You do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.